Hi, everyone. This is Dr. Cheryl Selman. Thank you for joining me. You are here with Living a Totally Healthy Life on Total Health TV. I'm so glad you're joining me today. And today we're going to be talking about dismantling the viral theory. It's a really important topic because so much of what we believe about viruses, which obviously is brought to our attention these days, has uh, a lot um, of myths and misinformation and untested theories. And we're going to explore all this with my guest. And my guest is Dr. Robert O. Young, who is a world-renowned and published scientist, microbiologist, nutritionist, and naturopathic practitioner. And it's my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Robert O. Um, Young with us today. Hello, Robert. Hello. Uh, good morning, and uh, nice to, to meet you uh, in this interview. So, Robert, it's such a pleasure to have you on the show. And I really was looking forward to this interview because you have such a uh, deep knowledge of understanding the role of viruses. Of course, the topic is dismantling the viral theory. Everyone is really curious about viruses. How do we protect against viruses? Do we wear, we wear masks? Do we sanitize our hands? Do we take a vaccine? Do we take vitamin C? Do we do more zinc? Uh, you know, to understand the strategies that people are looking for now, we need to go a little deeper into the story of the vaccine, uh, not the, the viruses. What's really a virus? What is really going on? What makes us susceptible to viruses? And um, when then from there, we can look at what are the really most effective, powerful steps to take to strengthen and enhance our health. So, so that's a lot of my first question, but let's just go in and talk about what actually is going on right now with this with this supposed viral pandemic, and what is the um, the, the the real understanding of what's driving this? Mm -hmm. Well, I think uh, most of your uh, listeners will be interested in in the Latin definition of virus, which which uh, uh, is defined as a poison. And so I like to look at viruses uh, not as microorganisms or germs. I like to look at them as poisonous uh, chemicals that cause disease. And there's, there's many contributing factors to that. So you talk about two prevailing paradigms that existed over 100 years ago. One, of course, we know is Louis Pasteur. He had the germ theory. And then the other lesser known person, Duchamp, who had a very different approach. And I want you to explain to my audience what those two different paradigms or theories were and why it's a relevant topic to have today and why your work is based on the theory that didn't prevail. So let's just explain and unpack that. Okay, well, uh, Louis Pasteur uh, in the uh, 18th, night, excuse me, the 19th century proposed that, uh, that germs, uh, in this case, it would be filterable bacteria, were the cause of disease. And they came from the outside world, causing a, a, a disturbance or an infection leading to various symptomologies. And of course, the first thing that he received uh, uh, notoriety over was the, uh, uh, the, the uh, infectious disease that related uh, to the virus of rabies. And uh, rabies uh, as being, having a chemical antidote uh, to actually treat that, uh, uh, that invasion. So the germ, theory proposes that there must be some sort of microorganism that's invading the body, causing the sickness and disease. On the other hand, uh, his contemporary, uh, Antoine Béchamp, postulated that germs were born in us and from us, and that these germs that were present in the fluids of the body and in the cells was a result of a compromise of the fluids of the body, and uh, these fluids... Uh, uh, and their chemistry uh, were not conducive for cells to stay within the, a particular uh, form. And so they would go through what is called a biological transformation, giving rise to bacteria. And so it was more not an infection, but
but an outfection. So that's such a different uh, approach, right? So, so profoundly diametrically opposed. We're being attacked from outside or we're creating these uh, in, uh, conditions due to the environment. So, so my question to you, is there such a thing as a virus that is causing these pandemics? Well, by, by definition, by the Latin de definition, are there chemicals causing these symptomologies? And the answer would be absolutely uh, correct. It's not a microorganism, it's, it's, it's uh, a radioactive or chemical poisoning. It's either electro or magnetic or chemical poisoning that's resulting in this. But to prove or disprove the existence of a virus is, is somewhat impossible. Uh, especially since it cannot be shown by using the scientific method where you actually isolate, identify, purify, and then culture to create the same and, and infect uh, another organism and create the same symptoms that, uh, that you found in the first specimen. Uh, this has not been proven for, for any virus that I know of uh, where the virus has actually been proven by the scientific method. So uh, I don't know if you have an answer to this, but when they talk about this virus was potentially theoretically created in a biohazard for, la for lab, uh, what do they do in those labs? I mean, they're supposedly creating these viral conditions or these viruses. I, you know, help help me understand that because I I know that there so many people have been talking about how the environment is altering our terrain, and I really get that our environment alters the terrain, makes us susceptible through all the toxins, and compromises our immune system, and then that just opens up a whole can of worms for us. And then there's the prevailing theories out there that it's a created virus. So, how do you explain what goes on in these biohazard for labs that supposedly are manipulating viruses well you know you have to you have to look at the uh, the infectious nature of of a particular uh, microorganism and and in order for uh, something to be infectious it, it needs to be either uh, ingested or it needs to be injected to to have to have effect on the human terrain which is basically a closed system when we're talking about the intervascular fluids. But to get into the interstitial fluids, those fluids uh, uh, which are literally managing and maintaining human waste uh, and using the lymphatic system to get rid of it, that uh, genetically modified organism or that particular chemical poison like, uh, like for example, potassium uh, oxide or formaldehyde or uh, or thimerosal, it, it needs to be injected into the fluids of the body. Uh, just ingesting it is, is not enough uh, to cause, cause any sort of sudden death. Or in this example, uh, what was happening in China where people would lose uh, oxygen uh, saturation uh, and they would actually just pass out and die from, uh, from a respiratory condition, a carbon dioxide poisoning, uh, or hypoxia. Uh, we can see that in high population areas uh, where there is, you know, factory pollution, where there is uh, carbon dioxide uh, emissions, uh, carbon dioxide emissions that are creating an environment that is, is highly toxic. And so respiratory diseases are quite high. You can breathe those into the lung and uh, we know even the chemicals and toxins in smoking uh, can cause uh, respiratory diseases, uh, even cancer. So air pollution is a contributing factor to disturbing the environment and polluting the internal environment. Uh, but to have something infectious, it, it has to get into the fluids of the body. And the best way to do that is not necessarily uh, if we're talking about a biological, you need to inject that. If we're talking about a chemical, then we have a perfect example uh, of, uh, of, of uh, poisoning such as Agent Orange. 
that was sprayed on people. I mean, this uh, as an aerosol, uh, that being taken into the lungs can cause compromised environment and then lead to cellular breakdown, giving rise to microorganisms rather than microorganisms causing it in and of themselves. We're talking about chemical chemical poisoning. So, so you know, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me in Wuhan uh, as it relates to a biological. It makes more sense to me if we're talking about radio uh, radioactive poisoning or if we're talking about uh, chemical poisoning as the main factor that leads to the symptoms associated with the coronavirus or the corona effect or what is now affectionately referred to as COVID-19. As a naturopathic doctor, I really, I really understand what you're saying because we live probably in the most toxic world that has ever been created. The air is polluted, the water is polluted, our food is polluted. We eat food that has no nutritional value but filled with preservatives and other chemicals. Um, we are under tremendous amount of stress. We are exposed to a tremendous amount of radiation from all our you know, Wi-Fi devices, not to mention radiation poisoning from Fukushima and things that spread all over the world. I mean, we are in a perfect toxic soup. And if we understand the theory of Bouchamp, which should be the prevailing paradigm, we would understand that we must clean ourselves up. We must clean the environment up. That's the cause of these pandemics. That's what makes us vulnerable to succumbing. And there's been so much confusion over this. Is it a, you know, is it a, a pneumonia-like condition? Is it a hypoxia condition? I mean, there's so much confusion because I think we really don't know what's going on at the bottom line of this whole issue right now. Well, it's, uh, uh, you know, the environments are toxic. Uh, our oceans are expressing that toxicity with the loss of coral calcium on the barrier reef off the coast of Australia. Uh, the pH or the chemistry of the, the ocean has dropped from uh, 8.4 to 8.3. Uh, that's a 25% increase in, in acidity in the ocean. Uh, if we have, like in Val, the Valdez spill, and we have toxicity of oil, uh, unrefined oil spilled in the ocean, we know what the effect is that, that that's going to be. So we have the evidence of environmental toxicity. When we look at uh, the forest of Denali and we see what carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide poisoning does to uh, the forests, our national forests in Alaska, in the forest of Denali, uh, this is caused by acid rain. So in the macro world, we can see the deterioration of our oceans our rivers and our streams and the death of the marine life. We can see uh, air pollution and uh, the cause of an increase of, of uh, respiratory disorders uh, and even cancer uh, from air pollution. And that needs to be controlled. Of course, one of the ways to control that is just to leave the large cities uh, for the mere fact that they're, they're highly toxic with, with acid rain. And, and, and we breathe this in, and then that disturbs our internal environment, which then causes the loss of calcium. For example, people are wondering why there's such a, an epidemic in, in osteoarthritis and osteoporosis. Well, the body uses the calcium of the body, the magnesium of the body, to maintain the alkaline design of the body fluids. Because if they're compromised, then I'll give you an example. If the pH of the blood goes from its ideal, which is 7.365, if it drops 0.1 to 7.265, you start experiencing symptoms, enervation, irritation, sensitivities, inflammation. If it drops from 7.265 to 7.1, you can go into a coma and die. So we're talking about 0 0.2 points reduction in the pH of the body fluids. 
So the blood does everything it can to preserve itself. How does it do that? It takes the coral reefs of our bones, the magnesium of our muscles and deteriorates those and pulls those into the fluids. And we wonder why am I losing bone mass as I get older? Why are older people more, more uh, at risk for these types of conditions? Because they don't have the symptoms. They, they're, if you compare their bodies to a car, we're looking at an older car that hasn't really been cared for. The oil hasn't been changed regularly. In other words, you know, the, the body's systems are breaking down because it's dealing with the onslaught of increases of acidic waste from our own external environment. And then when we eat something that's toxic or drink something that's toxic, that can, can, can cause biochemical changes in which the body has to go to its reserves. Well, if you run out of alkaline reserves, then you're going to start experiencing the symptoms of that. And one of the symptoms of death is a change in that biochemistry. But along the way, you're experiencing irritation, sensitivities, inflammation, ulceration, uh, induration, and finally degeneration. These are all symptoms of a compromise in the delicate alkaline pH of the environment. And sure, there's association then from that with germs or breakdown products. These breakdown products aren't the cause, but we're treating them as if they are the cause. So when we're looking at COVID and we're saying, well, you know, we have, you know, a condition here of a fever, we start treating the fever. I can phlegm in, in seasonal flu or influenza. And we start treating for that, not realizing that the underlying theme is systemic and that we've compromised our internal oceans, our internal rivers and streams have become severely polluted by what? By what we eat, by what we drink, by what we breathe, by what we think, by what we feel, by what we believe. It's how we live, where we live. And what exposures do I, do I have? Do I have a smart meter outside? And what is the contributing factor of a smart meter on my health? Am I, do I have a cell phone to my head? You know, or do I put it you know, comfortably inside my bra? Not me, but a woman puts it in their bra in order to carry it. When, uh, or, you know, and we have pictures, pictures of this using thermography and ultrasounds. And, and the tumors are identical to the shapes of these cell phones. The bottom line is it, it's, it's how we live. It's, it, you know, and, and where we live. And, and, and if we're gonna live in New York City, you know, why are there more diagnos diagnosis of COVID-19 in New York, more deaths in New York versus in LA or San Francisco? Or how about Billings, Montana, or Austin, Texas, or where you're from, I think, no, uh, in, you're from Oklahoma, or, or is that correct? You know, why yes. are there less incidences there? And it, it, it all comes to is what is your exposure to the environment, both from outside and inside? What are you eating? What are you drinking? What are you breathing? What are you thinking? What are you feeling? What are you believing? These are the contributing factors to disease. This is so profound and uh, it really needs to be driven home to people because so many people are just doing, changing nothing, doing nothing, just waiting for the vaccination to arrive, staying home, doing absolutely nothing different and not understanding the connection between the quality of their health, what they're eating and watching and their vulnerability to their immune system. So you are world renowned as a naturopathic practitioner, as a researcher of having a healing center with tremendous success, what are the top strategies or suggestions that you would recommend to people to start changing the terrain and creating more health and vitality and, and be becoming more self-resilient against anything because we are stronger within ourselves. We're more balanced within ourselves. You know, uh, 
I remember a comedian, I, I was just trying to think of his name here. Uh, and uh, he, did a, he did a kind of a skit where a person came in with a condition and uh, uh, apparently it was based on an emotional, he was a psychologist and he was trying to help this person. And his recommendation based upon the symptomologies was very simple. Whatever the symptomology is, well, I can't sleep, you know, you know, you know, I worry about things. And so his, his, uh, his, uh, his, his name was Bob Newhart. You remember Bob Newhart? I actually do remember Bob Newhart. <laughs> do, you, do you remember this skit where he's talking to this woman and she says, well, I worry a lot and then I can't sleep and, 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 and I can't eat and I, and I, and I, I have, I have fatigue. And his, he looked at it and says, well, you know, I'll, I, you know, we can, we can resolve this in about, uh, in about three minutes. I'll give you three minutes and it will only cost $5. And she's going, really? Well, I can afford that, $5. And he says, okay, go ahead, tell me what it is. And, he, and she says, well, I worry a lot and, and I, I think about things and, and then, you know, and then I can't sleep and, and so I'm not getting good rest and, you know, I wake up tired all the time. And, uh, and she went on this role and, and, uh, he said, okay, is that it? She says, yeah, that's it. And then he, he says, okay, well, here's my advice. Stop it. <laughs> and she looked at him in shock. That's your advice? Yes, stop it. <laughs> and that, that was his before. Stop it on YouTube, Bob Newhart. And his his, his uh, doctor's advice for for I can't sleep. You know I, I have uh, uh, this problem, and, and so his his was just stop it. Well, okay. Well, if you are drinking alcohol and you have liver problems, then stop it. <laughs> if you're eating meat and chicken and pork and you have a lung condition and, and you're putting in more nitric acid and uric acid, sulfuric acid, and the body's overwhelmed with acid, then, then you, you have to stop it. You, you have to stop things. And, and there are so, so, some things you can do. I don't wanna be so simplistic of this, but when the blood is coagulating, and I don't know if you can picture this in your mind, but a red blood cell diameter is seven microns, and a micron measures one twenty-five thousandths of an inch. So red blood cells are very, very small. But the capillaries that go in, in order to get oxygen at the alveoli, measure three microns. So a red blood cell is seven microns. It actually has to squeeze itself in to the capillaries to pick up oxygen and then leave to go back out to general circulation. Now, if you're having symptoms, okay, respiratory symptoms, okay, that's not a disease. The disease is happening in the chemistry of the blood and the interstitial fluids. And those are two different fluids. Blood fluids are called intravascular fluids, making up 20% of, of, the, of the extracellular fluids. Interstitial fluids are the fluids that surround every cell. So there's fluids that surround all the cells. There's 70 trillion cells, and they're sitting in water, in fluid. It's called interstitial fluid, okay? The fluids inside the cell are called intracellular fluids. While cells are functioning, you know, there's toxicity. That's pushed out into the interstitial fluid. The blood receives toxins, and it's functioning, and it pushes acid waste or toxins out into the interstitial fluid. This fluid is controlled and then eliminated through, through general elimination through the lymphatic system. And if it's not, it goes into the connective tissue, i.e. also the fatty tissue. It's the main reason and the main cause for obesity. It's not because you're over fat, you're over acid. And so this, this, these acids of the body, which are metabolic waste, trying, the body's trying to get rid of dietary waste, 
If you're contributing to that waste by what you eat and what you drink, you need to back off that and move more to a plant-based alkaline diet. Move more to foods that will detoxify those fluids and support true immunity, which is not found, by the way, with the white cells. You don't build up the immune system. You, you support the immune system because they're just glorified janitors going around and picking up your garbage. I mean, if you say cobwebs in the house, what do you do? You go and you try to get rid of that, okay? Well, that's what white blood cells do. If they see dust or dirt or microorganisms or cobwebs, they try to go in there and clean it up. Well, what if you didn't have any of that? Then you'd be supporting the immune system by managing what you eat, what you drink, even your thoughts become biology because thoughts require life force energy. Okay, when you're thinking, cells are functioning. And when they're functioning, they're producing waste. Now, how can you relate to that? When your car is sitting out in your garage or out your, your driveway, is it producing waste? No, it only produces waste when you turn it on. When you turn it on, it has an exhaust system and it, remo it removes its exhaust because if it doesn't remove exhaust, like if you put a potato in the exhaust pipe, like the Keystone cops would do, you know, I mean, the robbers would do to the Keystone cops, they'd put a potato in the exhaust pipe. They would drive for a few feet and the car would shut down. If you can't remove your own waste, then you shut down. So you have a choice. You can either meditate Try to get out of your thought processes because women have a lot of time men. Okay? Uh, and these thoughts require life force electrical energy, which produce chemical waste, which can make you sick. So you have to stop having thoughts. You have to literally put your play put yourself in a serene area where you have no thoughts. That's called meditation. Exercise is a great thing to do because you're, you're solving a couple problems. One, you're generally not thinking. You're concentrating like on breathing through your nose and out through your mouth. And, and what's happening is you're activating the interstitial fluids, which are activated by the calf muscles, which are contracting. Interstitial fluids are flowing into the lymphatic system to remove out through the pores of the skin. So how do you remove interior waste from metabolism diet? You sweat it out. And so that's where infrared sauna becomes very important because infrared sauna activates the interstitial fluids to move in and out through the pores of the skin. So now I'm giving you several things. You've got to look at what you're eating, what you're drinking, and what you're thinking to reduce the acid loads on the interstitial fluids which surround every cell in the human body that affects everything from breathing to thinking, your brain function, your liver, all these functions of the body are surrounded by these, these fluids and the waste that come from cells. So you have to get rid of this and there's ways to do that. Robert, does it, is it helpful to use those pH strips to test your urine to see about your pH? Well, do you recommend those? Yeah, well, they're, they're really, uh, an indirect a monitor of testing the interstitial fluids because the urine is a waste from the uh, the fluids of the of the interstitium uh, and it, 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 it comes through the lymphatic system and then of course through the various organs the bowels the urinary tract system uh, and through uh, elimination even through the pores of the skin so uh, you can measure the pH of the, of the interstitial fluids by measuring the pH of the urine. Uh, so ideally that pH should be at least 7.2 or greater. Most people, if they have a condition or if they're at risk, will be uh, consistently within a pH of anywhere from uh, 5.5 to, to, to 6.5. Uh, you don't want to be there. Uh, there are what it calls, just like in the ocean, there's ebbs and tides. There's ebbs and tides of our body fluids. 
So the most acidic time of, uh, of the uh, interstitial fluids is, or where you're measuring the urine is at uh, around 3 a.m. in the morning. Now, I'm not recommending that you, you get up at 3 a.m. and test your body fluids. It's not a bad idea, but if you do wake up, you can test your urine when you wake up. The first urine and the second urine is the best indication of where you're at as it relates to one of the most important measurements, which is the measurement of the pH, which is measuring, you know, alkalinity or acidity. It's measuring the concentration of hydrogen. That's what pH stands for, the potential of hydrogen. So when you're measuring that, you're measuring risk factors that could express themselves in, uh, because if you're staying in a, in a very low pH, you're exposed to more of these acid contributing factors, which are causing membrane deterioration and genetic mutations. So you're more at risk for, for all types of inflammatory conditions and, and degenerative conditions. You can prevent that and extend the quality and quantity of your life by just simply for $10, purchasing some pH hydrant paper and testing this and keeping a diary. And any time that your pH is below 7.2 is by introducing uh, a, an alkaline buffer. Now, the one that the stomach makes is called sodium bicarbonate. It makes it constantly throughout the day to maintain the alkalinity of the fluids. But you can actually take an aluminum-free sodium and potassium bicarbonate that can help support the alkaline design of your bodily functions or alkaline design of your bodily fluids through the, the functionality of various organs, glands, and tissues. When you do that, when you bathe the cells in alkalinity, which make up all your cells and tissues, then you get more alkaline. And this is how you restore health and vitality. So sodium bicarbonate is the number one produced uh, compound in the human body it's happening for every thought, word, and deed to manage and maintain these fluids. And it's produced in the lining of the stomach. And this is what causes uh, nausea or ad nauseum. The pathology of this is unknown uh, to uh, medical science, but it's very simple. Ad nauseum is caused by what you eat or what you drink or what you think. And the body's then production of sodium bicarbonate to buffer the metabolic or dietary or respiratory or environmental acid that you've just now introduced into the body or exposed yourself with your, your excessive thoughts. 80% of all heart attacks are caused by thoughts. So I don't call them heart attacks, I call them thought attacks. Uh, and these need to be managed and understood that they do become our biology and can and in fact affect the delicate pH balance of our internal fluids of our body, which leads to sickness and disease. You know, that is such a simple and profound strategy. Get the little pH testing strips that you can get online and get some of the um, sodium bicarbonate, not the stuff you normally get in the supermarkets because that has aluminum in it. So you have to find the more um, natural form of it. That's, that's just a simple strategy. Monitor yourself every day. Start paying attention to what's going on, what you're putting into your body, and what's coming out of your body is uh, a, a simple, practical, and profound strategy that has huge implications for our health. So, uh, Robert, you've shared so much with us today and given us such deep, um, deep, deep uh you know, understanding of these dynamics. And I just really want to thank you for the years of research, your passion, getting a, a message out to wake up, you know, to stop it. <laughs> stop. Stop doing the yeah. things that are making us vulnerable and start making the choices that will support our health and our life and our longevity and our planet. So I want you to know we're all very grateful to your dedication over all these years. And thank you so much for being with us today. Well, thank you for having me on your show. And uh, uh, my, my greatest hope and, and thoughts go to those uh, individuals and families that are suffering from any disease and particularly from this uh, pandemic that's happening. Uh, you know, I, my heart goes out to, to anyone who's lost a loved one 
and uh, uh, this doesn't this can stop can stop right now if we'll understand the simple uh, the simple understanding that that we are in control and can manage our lifestyle and diet. Genetics does not determine that. You know, a virus does not determine it. it doesn't determine that. We determine that by how we live our life. We are in control, and I want to give that that hope and understanding to people that they do not have to suffer. They do not have to have, you know, pains, you know, for the rest of their life, that they can change, they can save their lives and change their lives if they'll understand the terrain theory and start protecting the internal environment where true immunity begins, support the white blood cells in their endeavor to manage and maintain internal, internal cleanliness and keep the pathways of respiration, defecation, urination, and perspiration open through how you live your life so that you can enjoy the food you eat, enjoy all of your life experiences with your, your, uh, your loved ones, with your family, and, and live a, a fulfilled life you know, of energy, you know, and vitality. And this can be yours if you choose it to be. Such wise words. Thank you so much, Robert O. Um, Young. I appreciate everything you've been doing and uh, wishing you all the best. Thanks for being with us all right. today. Thanks, uh, Cheryl. Nice meeting you too. Bye now. Bye and, now. Uh, and to all of you, thank you for joining me today. Um, if you like what we're doing, you want to support us, please go to our Facebook page, go to our YouTube channel, and stay tuned because our next episode is with Dr. Jack Cruz, and he is going to help us embrace chaos and uh, emerge out of the matrix into a greater possibility of health and well-being. So we'll see you there. Bye for now.